In this study, we will take a much closer and more scientific look at the cosmological argument. In order for the first cause argument for God to be compelling, we have to establish that the universe is a contingent being which had a beginning. And just for clarity, we define the universe as the physical realm in which we live, comprised of space, time, and matter. A lot of Christians scoff when they hear references to the Big Bang Theory because it's usually described as a natural phenomenon that happened all by itself. But if you think about it, Genesis 1-1 sounds very much like a Big Bang. Suddenly, time, space, and matter sprung into existence by the hand of God. In fact, the Big Bang Theory does more to support the cosmological argument for God because it makes a strong case for the universe having a beginning. An excellent book, which I'll refer to in later segments, is I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norman Giesler and Frank Turek. Although they're not scientists, they are PhDs who do a great job of presenting well-documented evidence and arguments in support of the Bible. They also converted to Christianity after having examined the evidences for it, so clearly they found it convincing. In the chapter titled, In the Beginning There Was a Great Surge, Giesler and Turek give five solid reasons that provide compelling evidence that our universe did have a beginning, something that agnostics like Bertrand Russell have questioned in order to deny that the universe needed a cause. Before we take a deeper look at the reasons that skeptics have proposed for why the universe didn't need a supernatural cause, let's see why it makes sense that it did. Einstein's monumental contribution to the field of physics has an important application in the study of the cosmos. The equations that Einstein found, which have been proven to be precisely reliable, predicted that the universe would have to be dynamic, that is, changing. These equations ultimately lead back to a space-time singularity at the beginning of the universe. Einstein was initially disinclined to believe this, so he made up a cosmological constant in order to force his theory to predict a static universe. This constant, which Einstein later referred to as the greatest blunder of his life, was later proven both mathematically and empirically to be flawed. The prediction that the universe is expanding was later confirmed by several astronomical discoveries, and is one of the main reasons that the Big Bang Theory is widely accepted today as the most scientific explanation for the universe's beginning. The second law of thermodynamics introduces the concept of entropy, tending toward a maximum, defined by the Encyclopedia Encarta as follows. The disorder of an isolated system has a tendency to increase. The disorder will never decrease unless an external agent can cause its decrease. It's worth noting that while the concept of entropy does make a strong argument against the probability of evolution, it's not entirely applicable to that topic, because on smaller scales, the external environment can theoretically decrease the disorder. However, in the case of the universe, which scientists generally believe to be surrounded by essentially nothing in normal dimensional terms, there is no external anything. Thus, the accepted de definition of entropy tells us that the universe must be tending toward disorder. However, if the universe is infinitely old, there can no longer be any order left. There would be no stars or suns still burning, and all energy that was once trapped in matter would have been released. Thus, the universe must be finite. One of the reasons that nearly all scientists believe the universe to be expanding was provided by Edwin Hubble. It was he who discovered that the galaxies in the universe exhibited redshift. Redshift refers to the change in wavelength of light given off by objects as they move away from our point of view. He found that the most distant galaxies had the most redshift, while closer ones had less. This means that not only are galaxies moving farther apart from one another, they also appear to be accelerating. In order for the universe's acceleration to be reversed, physics tells us that an outside force would have to be involved. We'll revisit this topic in a moment. In 1965, two astronomers at Bell Labs, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, discovered the presence of mysterious radiation throughout space. As it turns out, they had stumbled across background radiation, energy that is emitted by an explosion. In response to this Nobel Prize winning finding, agnostic astronomer Robert Jastrow concluded, at the present time, the Big Bang Theory has no competitors. 
Practically no scientists deny that this evidence does indeed rule out the idea that the universe has a steady state existence. Finally, Geisler and Turek discuss the existence of temperature ripples in the universe, causing matter to congregate into galaxies. Scientists had predicted that this phenomenon should exist if the Big Bang had occurred. True to their calculations, it was discovered in 1992 by a NASA satellite named COBE, or Cosmic Background Explorer. Stephen Hawking called what COBE found the most important discovery of the century, if not all time. Quoting Geisler and Turek, Kobe not only found ripples, but scientists were amazed at their precision. The ripples show that the explosion and expansion of the universe was precisely tweaked to cause just enough matter to congregate to allow galaxy formation, but not enough to cause the universe to collapse back on itself. Any slight variation one way or the other, and none of us would be here to tell about it. In fact, the ripples are so exact, down to one part in 100,000, that Kobe project leader George Smoot called them the machining marks from the creation of the universe and the fingerprints of the maker. So assuming that there is no time, space, matter, or energy outside of our universe, and concluding from the previous arguments that our universe had a beginning, the Big Bang Theory actually gels with biblical teaching quite well. We'll get into the biblical account of creation in more detail later, but for now I'll sum it up like this. The mounting evidence of our universe's origin suggests that all matter, time, and space was once compressed into a singularity. Over billions of years, it has expanded, and the matter and energy have arranged themselves to form the vast and complex universe we now live in. Since we believe time to be contained within our universe, then time also had a beginning. And if time really is linear and expanding like the universe, then it is not infinite, for every moment that passes makes it larger. Science, being the study of the natural world, by definition cannot address what happened before the beginning of time. Thus, we are left with the question, what or who put that singularity of time, matter, and space there in the first place, and what was the impetus that caused it to explode? Additionally, how are the laws of physics which govern th that singularity made so perfect to produce the ordered universe we now find ourselves in? Observing nature can give us no explanation, which logically leaves us with a supernatural one. Theists the world over have a word for this, God. But what about naturalists, whose worldview prevents them from accepting the existence of God? Atheists have put forth a number of arguments to explain the Big Bang in godless terms. We touched on one of these when discussing the cosmological argument. David Hume suggests that since the material world contains order, we can assert it to be God and not have to give it a cause. In other words, if we accept that something exists which was uncaused, God, why couldn't that thing be the universe? To further this argument, some atheists have quoted physicist Edward Tryon, who claims that quantum electrodynamics reveals that an electron, positron, and photon occasionally emerge spontaneously in a perfect vacuum, without cause. But an online search for Tryon's scientific publications yields very little except for the article in the scientific journal Nature that this quote comes from. Additionally, this quote only seems to be taken seriously on sites like infidels.org that have a philosophical axe to grind. In other words, the idea that quantum mechanics involves creation ex nihilo appears to be a fringe theory that has received little attention in the scientific world. But back to the suggestion that it's enough to consider our universe uncaused, and thus define it as God. The problem with this is the fact that our universe is bound by natural laws, and these natural laws include the causal relationship that we see everywhere in nature. To suggest that the universe is uncaused contradicts the very laws of that universe. Laws like the conservation of energy say that you can't get something from nothing. Something always has to give. Clearly, we have something. So what gave? The fact is that there is no natural explanation for our universe's existence. God, on the other hand, being supernatural, is not limited by these laws, and so it is not a contradiction of his nature to suggest that he was uncaused. Atheists who suggest otherwise simply don't understand the meaning of the word supernatural.
I mentioned the idea that our universe may be in a constant cycle of expansion and contraction. While this is impossible to explain in terms of established laws of physics, the exploration of string theory has led to a similar proposal. This stringy cosmology suggests that the universe actually started out very large and unstable, and collapsed until it reached a certain point where its acceleration reversed and started what we know of as the Big Bang. Whether this concept will ever become well established is unlikely due to its highly theoretical and unobservable nature, but it does introduce a sort of explanation for an expanding and contracting universe. Still, even if theorists were to suggest an eternal universe based on this, common sense tells us that something unnatural still had to put it all there. Renowned physicist Stephen Hawking has his own theories about the beginning of time. His no-boundary proposal suggests that the universe is a wave function that has no beginning or end. This is a purely mathematical and theoretical idea that can never be proven, and as Hawking admits, it uses imaginary time that is completely distinct from real time. In his book A Brief History of Time, Hawking writes, When one goes back to the real time in which we live, however, there will still appear to be singularities. In real time, the universe has a beginning and an end at singularities that form a boundary to space-time, and at which the laws of science break down. Hawking's imaginary explanation is just that, a concept that can never be established scientifically, and thus, for all we know, something that exists only in the mind and not in reality. Thus, while it may be cathartic for Hawking in his quest to find meaning through reason and mathematics, Assuming it to be true is as much an act of faith as believing in the Christian God. I would say more so. I'd like to conclude with a number of quotes, many of them by renowned scientists, which sum up nicely the issue of the universe's beginning. Time is that dimension in which cause and effect phenomena take place. If time's beginning is concurrent with the beginning of the universe, as the space-time theorem says, then the cause of the universe must be some entity operating in a time dimension completely independent of and pre-existent to the time dimension of the cosmos. This conclusion is powerfully important to our understanding of who God is and who or what God isn't. It tells us that the Creator is transcendent, operating beyond the dimensional limits of the universe, and it tells us that God is not the universe itself, nor is God contained within the universe. Astrophysicist and founder of progressive creationist think tank Reasons.org, Hugh Ross. In my view, the question of origin seems to be left unanswered if we explore from a scientific view alone. Thus, I believe there is a need for some religious or metaphysical explanation. I believe in the concept of God and in his existence. Nobel Prize winning physicist Charlie Towns. Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which is created out of nothing one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural, plan. Nobel Prize winning physicist Arno Penzias. I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence, why there is something instead of nothing. Crawford Prize winning astronomer Alan Sandage. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Crawford Prize winning astronomer Fred Hoyle. In the very beginning there was a void a curious form of vacuum, a nothingness containing no space, no time, no matter, no light, no sound. Yet the laws of nature were in place, and this curious vacuum held potential. Like a giant boulder perched at the edge of a towering cliff, wait a minute, before the boulder falls I should explain that I really don't know what I'm talking about. A story logically begins at the beginning, but this story is about the universe, and unfortunately there are no data for the very beginning. None. Zero. We don't know anything about the universe until it reaches the mature age of a billionth of a trillionth of a second, that is, some very short time after creation in the Big Bang. 
When you read or hear anything about the birth of the universe, someone is making it up. We are in the realm of philosophy. Only God knows what happened at the very beginning, and so far she hasn't let on. Nobel Prize winning physicist Leon Lederman even if there is only one possible unified theory of quantum mechanics and gravity, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Astrophysicist Stephen Hawking For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. NASA physicist Robert Jastrow Everything in physical science is a lot of protons, neutrons, and electrons, while in daily life we talk about men in history or beauty and hope. Which is nearer to God, beauty and hope, or the fundamental laws? To stand at either end and to walk off that end of the pier only, hoping that out in that direction is a complete understanding, is a mistake. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things He has made. Romans 1.20